James, Dahlia, thank you so much for spending a little bit of your time with us today. By now, everyone knows you are the two halves of Married to Health. I love talking to you guys because I have interviewed so many experts on gut health and the like, and uh, I always come away from you guys learning a little bit more, but also I love the approachability and the simplicity with which you can um, create these concepts in our minds. So I'm really excited to impart some of this wisdom to our community today. And thank you again for sharing your time with us. Thanks yeah. for having us. We're excited to start talking about all things gut health. Awesome. Um, well, let's start there. Uh, how do we define gut health? And, and I know these concepts are, are very uh, difficult uh, to, to be brief around, but microbiota, microbiome, microbes, right? There's a lot of words that we always hear, and I don't think anyone actually knows what is the difference between those two things. So I know, James, you've got a great analogy for this. So maybe we could just start with defining how do we talk about gut health? Yes. Uh, with some definitions, I mean, microbiome is a really cool word because microbiome is not just the microbes, right? It's not just the, the individual microbes or the species and population. That is also encompassing their genome. So like what they do, their genes and what those genes encode, microbiota is the population. So that is looking at the species and the sheer numbers, right? So yeah, a great analogy for this is thinking of it like a city, right? You could have one city that's a hundred thousand population, another city that's a hundred thousand population, but those cities can do and look and act very differently, right? So just because they have the same population, doesn't mean they're going to do the same things. They'll have different jobs, different infrastructure, they'll produce different commodities, and different things will come out of those cities. So it's important to understand that. Um, and then with that population, there are viruses, bacteria, archaea, fungi. And so when we say microbes, we kind of just generally mean all of those things, but they can be very different. But those are the big three definitions, microbiome, microbiota, and microbes. <laughs> Very cool. And we're going to get into how you change those, how you maintain them, how you nurture those those diverse populations. But before we get there, just staying a high level as a patient, right? Or if you think about symptoms, um, if you don't have any bloating or any GI issues to speak of, we're starting to learn that that may not actually be an indication of health, or maybe it is, but the story is a little bit more complicated. So if I'm not feeling any of those GI challenges, does that mean I'm, I'm good? I don't have to think about my, my gut health? We always want to be thinking about our gut health because we know that our gut communicates systemically. It communicates with all of our organs. So if someone says, I poop every day, I'm fine, not bloated, but... I have acne, I have hormonal imbalance, I have blood sugar irregularities, I have really high cholesterol, I have high blood pressure. Those all can really come back to the gut. So we always wanna have our gut health front and center because it can just love on every other part of our body. And, and how do you know if some challenge that you're dealing with might be tied to the gut? So you, you mentioned acne, right? We know immunity is a is is a uh, um, uh, highly correlated with gut health these days. But but what what is your recommendation to someone who says like yeah you know I'm not sleeping well or my recovery is off or or maybe they have some sort of chronic disease? How how do you know if that's connected to your gut? I always ask tons of questions. Tell me about your gut health story every single day. I ask how many bowel movements are you having in a day? What do they look like? We look at the Bristol stool chart together. I ask, is there mucus, blood, undigested food in your stool? Um, are you bloated? Are you excessively gassy? Do you have malodorous gas? Are you having any other stomach discomfort? So I want to know every single detail about it because some of these little mini symptoms might not seem apparent to many, but that can really be an indicator that something might be awry with your gut health. And and then specifically, I know everyone, uh, we're, we're hopefully on the tail end of COVID, but immunity has been on everyone's mind. Um, we're learning more and more that 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 microbiota, I think that's the right word, um, it drives so much of our immune response and just generally what we think of as our immunity. 
Talk a little bit about why why is that? What what's going on there? Yeah, so this is really cool. When it comes to the gut microbiome or just our whole body microbiome, we're really speaking to that structure. So this is what's called the innate immunity, where you have these barriers and your microbes are your little warriors. They are building this mucosal barrier. They help reinforcing structures of your physiology and anatomy. And so, you know, whether you're talking about the nasal mucosa, you have a microbiome there, you're talking about the oral microbiome where you're eating and, and air. So basically anywhere the outside environment comes into contact with your body, you have like these little microbial warriors there building up that, that barrier really kind of, really kind of being the doorman, so to speak. Right. And like really checking IDs and checking people coming into your body. And when I say people, it's microbes or other things from the environment and going, Hmm, are you, are you okay? Should you be coming in? And really that innate immunity is your first line of defense. And if that is lacking, your first line of defense is lacking for sure. Awesome. So we're, we're painting a picture. I see the city, right? You know, the microbiota, the people working in the city, the microbiome is more the called the, the cultural ethnicity, whatever, right? The DNA. Um, and then you've got the doorman guarding our mucosal lining to make sure only the good stuff gets in. So, and then what about a mood? So, so we also hear so much about the vagus nerve and, you know, you're, you've got a gut feeling, right? We, we talk about the gut being like the second brain. What, why is that? What's going on there? So we know that the gut now, we now know, right, that the gut controls more signals to the brain than our signals to the gut. So we're producing large amounts of these neurotransmitters like dopamine, serotonin, in our gut, our microbes are communicating need for production of those from our gut. And so like I was mentioning in the past, we thought, okay, our brain is craving these things. Now we're understanding our microbes are starting to crave, whether it's more inflammatory foods or more anti-inflammatory type foods. Our microbes are really the directors of this and a healthy microbiome, a healthy microbiota will help to produce sufficient amounts of these neurotransmitters. And that's why we love to think of good mood food, right? These anti-inflammatory foods can help then put forth more of that serotonin. You're getting more of that dopamine drip from these mm -hmm. everyday healthy foods. And we're not craving these hyper palatable, hyper concentrated foods quite as much because our really intelligent microbiome and microbiota understand that's going to wreak havoc and really cause that disruption, that dysbiosis. And this really speaks to the work our microbes are doing, right? So our microbes are producers and they're also recyclers. So this gets into that term postbiotic. This is another term. This is basically the outcome of microbial activity, right? What they're creating, what they're making. A lot of this is happening in our colon and what they're making our neurotransmitters, our protein precursors, our short chain fatty acids and Vitamin. much more vitamins even. So really cool things they're making. They're also recycling as well. So they're recycling these neurotransmitters as well as making them and recycling hormones and so much more. So that really speaks to that, the, the jobs in the city, right? And what they're doing on a daily basis um it's overwhelming to try to to wrap our our head around actually when you start thinking about all of that you know we we really do take for granted just that that complexity and that beautiful symphony that's happening like you said i mean short chain fatty acids neurotransmitters the precursors to to proteins you know and then obviously you know as dahlia mentioned vitamins right digestion the bile i mean it, there's so much going on in the gut that um i'm i'm grateful that you guys are here to unpack it uh for us um and i mean just just to kind of put it in this way i think in in Asian religion, or whether I think it's Taoism or Buddhism, there's this idea of the giant turtle, right? And we are this, it's an idea that there's this giant turtle, we're just living on it, like this earth and the universe, we're on the back of a giant turtle. That's essentially us with our microbiome. There is this vast universe, this vast population. Do they realize where they are? Do, do we even know what they're doing fully, right? And we're, we're kind of exploring this. Do they even know we're moving around and I got to, I'm doing, I'm talking to you, Matt, and I got to go and drive in my car, go pick up my daughter and all this, this universe within me 
it's kind of like I'm the big turtle and they're just floating in and on me and who knows what, what they know. And it's, it's kind of a trip when I, when you said that, it just kind of, yeah. kind of popped in my mind. <laughs> no, it, it, you know, there's a, like those Russian stacking dolls, right? You know, it's, it's kind of like that. We're on a giant turtle. We are the giant turtle. You know, we may find out that things are even more complex on a, you know, kind of physical level, way down layer after layer. It, it is amazing. Um, but that leads me to my question. Because it's so complex, because it is so beautifully intricate, um, it's very easy to disrupt. So I'm curious, and maybe we can transition the, the conversation a little bit to, to thinking about what leads to, to poor gut health. And I know it's, um, uh, complicated. So maybe I'll, 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 I'll open it up in general by, by asking, you know, if I exercise, I generally sleep well and I eat a plant-based diet, am I good? Is everything else going to, that's all I need to worry about, right? I think you're putting in work. If you're doing that, you're putting in the hardest part, right? You're doing that daily work to really feed on, feed into and love on your gut microbes. Mm -hmm. So exercise, we have seen in new studies, even exercise can increase output of short chain fatty acids. So that's going to help repair your gut microbiome. The food that we eat is literally fuel for these microbes. So the prebiotic fiber, soluble fiber, insoluble fiber, Fiber, the phytonutrients, antioxidants, all of these things are food and fuel for the microbes. Um, and sleep is a chance for them to kind of catch up, get restored, get in better balance. Those are foundational aspects of it. If somebody is doing those things, and this happens daily with my patients, they'll come to me and say, but I went plant-based, but I sleep well, but I exercise, and I still don't feel well. You really want to understand how is your foundation? Were there things that affected your foundation prior to you making these changes? And that just, one, you can't go back and change them, but one, it gives you a little bit more patience to understand them a little bit better. Uh, you know, I like to ask my patients things like, how is your mom's gut health when she was pregnant with you? We know that microbiomes can communicate. Um, you know, were you born vaginally or via, via C-section? Were you breastfed? How was your diet as a child? How many antibiotics and steroids have you taken throughout your life? Um, you know, have you had periods of your life where you were extremely stressed? Have you gone through trauma? Have you had a period, you know, college for most of us where you were not eating the best or binge drinking? Um, so that way you just have that patience and understanding of what was my gut health story leading up to this point? And now what can I do about it? I can't build a time machine and go back, but what are some other habits that I can really hone in on to ensure that I'm continuing to repair maybe my fractured structure and my fractured foundation? foundation in my gut. So that way, mm. this plant-based diet that I'm on, this plant-based lifestyle that I'm living is sustainable for me. And I'm not looking back saying, I can't tolerate plant foods, but I'm saying I'm starting to add in more richness to my diet and diversity to my diet. I'm starting to add in more diversity to my workouts. And that is going to then pay itself forward. You're going to get a good, really good return on investment to have a richer, more diverse population in your gut. If, if I could paint this back to imagine the cities and you have very different cities and then there's gardens in the cities, right? So what Dolly mentioned was foundational things. And, and I want to imagine you have two different cities trying to grow a garden and they have everything, the raised bed, the seeds, the soil, the water. However, this is where context matters and, and realizing, hey, I'm in a city in Alaska versus a city in Southern California your garden's going to be very different. You may have the same foundational items, right? The raised bed, the soil, the seeds, and the water, but the climate matters, right? The water quality matters. Maybe there's some contaminants in the soil. So this is where you may need better compost or you may need some other fertilizers. You may need a greenhouse, right, to cover. And there's all these other kind of additives, whether we're complementing or just adding some of these, these just minor tweaks you need because you're in a different city then that, that's what we need to do. So the foundation could be there, but the context definitely matters. I, I foresee us creating a uh, really uh, detailed infographic with, with James layers of the city. There's some turtles, there's a city. We got like the sewage system, there's gardens over here. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm getting it though. I'm getting it, it's, it's, it's there. Um, 
Cool. So a couple, uh, you mentioned a number of factors and, and almost um, innumerable I- I- influences, right? All the way back from when we're in the womb. Um, so just to maybe focus on one of them that is probably applicable to everyone watching this, stress. H- how does, you know, and, and w- we can get to like, how do you control stress through exercise or better sleep or meditation? Like setting aside dealing with stress, just from a mechanical basis, um, wh- why does stress affect our, our gut so much? So we want to understand different types of stress, right? There can be physical stress from things like injuries. Um, There can be chemical stress from things we're exposed to, foods, supplements, things like that. And there can be emotional stress, so mental and emotional stress. That is almost exactly equal to the food that we eat in our gut microbes eyes, right? These microbes really will consume all these different inputs, whether that's our food, our sleep, and our stress. Mm -hmm. So when we have high levels of mental emotional stress, when our body is focused on healing physical stress, when we're under chemical stress, our microbes are gonna try to help us balance that out. And that might then cause that shift in who's living in our gut that could in and of itself facilitate dysbiosis imbalance. Um, The thoughts we consume are very equivalent to the foods that we consume. We're feeding those to our gut microbes. And then that based on those things, that is what they're going to be able to give us in return, those short chain fatty acids, those postbiotics, they're recycling what we're giving them. So that could be inflammatory inflammatory stress, inflammatory food, and their output will reflect that. Right. And, and stress, we want to want to make it very clear. Stress is good. Stress is, is definitely it a good be. and it can be a very healthy response. But uh, so we like to use the, the analogy of fire. Fire is also very good. We like to cook our food. We like to be warm in the winter. So fire is great. But if we left that furnace on all the time and in different ways, right? So we're getting all these different stress inputs and constantly leaving that furnace on, we're going to burn out the furnace or worse, burn down the house. So we really just want to be aware of utilizing stress when needed, but having the ability to turn it off when not needed and not just leaving the fire on. And then you get that inflammation, which is literally Latin for in flames or on fire. And you're getting that chronic, you're chronically on fire. <laughs> so let's talk about how do we put out the fire? How do we reduce inflammation? You know, we, we kind of started the conversation mapping out the, uh, the, um, the, the city. I was going to say the landscape. Um, you know, we talked about what can go wrong and all those different inputs, right? So we need a holistic approach. But in particular, uh, I'd love to dive in a little bit on, you know, how does a plant-based diet improve your gut health or, or your, your microbiota, if you will? Um, and one question that I have, because we get it a lot, is how long does it take? So why, did, why do plants help? And say you're just, you're, you're new to a plant-based diet or you're, you're treating some, some GI issues or some, some larger um, systemic issues with plants, how, how long until our, our, our microbiome uh, starts to evolve and change with those new inputs? I think that's such a great question that we also receive very regularly. And so one, you want to ask who is adding logs to this fire? Who's adding logs to the furnace? You want to try to address those things. So again, whatever that may be. But as far as nutrition goes, if we know that we're now no longer adding logs, you're not adding more inflammatory food. And what is inflammatory food on a plant-based or even a vegan diet? Let's talk. Um, It's added in refined sugar added in refined grains. So those highly refined carbohydrates we know can be drivers of that fire, that inflammation, their logs. And again, you can tolerate a small amount, but you don't want to add too much. Saturated fats. I think that's a misconception in the plant-based world that a vegan diet is free of saturated fat. It's free of cholesterol, but saturated fats can still come from coconut oil and palm oil. So we know those saturated fats can be inflammatory as well. Alcohol can be part of a a vegan diet, a plant-based diet. So we want to say, first, let's stop adding to the fire, right? Because yes, we want to call in the firemen and bring in fire extinguishers, but we don't want to be simultaneously continuing to add to the fire. So we want to be able to address that side of it. And then who are the firefighters? 
is, right? Um, fiber. So fiber is going to be an amazing firefighter to decrease that inflammation. And fibrous foods, fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, mm -hmm. beans, grains, legumes, herbs, spices, those bring in fiber. They bring in antioxidants. They bring in phytonutrients. So they're really the complete package where they can help quelch that. It might take them a couple of weeks, depending on how large the fire was. It could take them a couple of months. For others, it could take a couple of years. So it really is individual. You really want to get a realistic picture on how big is my fire? What am I looking at? What am I dealing with? What are these everyday habits that I can be adding? And what are some that I can be maybe pulling back from? And you mentioned two specific nutrients, um, fiber and uh, saturated fat. So, so out of curiosity, you specifically mentioned um, palm oil and coconut oil. So, you know, one of the concerns I always have, because uh, I'm raising little ones, is are they getting enough good fats, right? So talk to us about how, how, how should we think about the difference between saturated fat that might come from an avocado or a nut versus like a palm oil or a coconut oil? Or perhaps there's no difference and we should stay away from all of it and, and be on a zero fat diet. No, I think, I mean, as we're looking through the research and as we understand just even plant nutrition and as we understand the connection to the microbes in our gut, we're, the big word that comes to mind is synergy, right? Mm -hmm. So it's this idea of when you're getting, let's say, saturated fat, when you're eating, let's say, a whole coconut versus coconut oil, um, it's, it's a very different way that the microbes are then interacting with that food, the way we're digesting that food, the postbiotics, right? what the microbes are making from that food, right? So this is where the context matters. So when you're eating that whole food fat versus the hyper-refined fat, it is very, very important that we are understanding that context and making those choices, uh, and especially if they're daily choices, going for more of the whole food options. Uh, and that can be definitely uh, an area of omega-3s as well. So yeah, avocado is great, but... Uh, but essentially omega-3s are essential to the gut microbiome. There's been some great studies done where omega-3s can really interact and shape the way our microbiome and microbiota function and how our population and what they do in our gut, how they function and interact. Uh, and so you're getting things like from walnuts and chia seed and flax seed uh, versus palm oil or any other hyper-refined oils or coconut oil, uh, you're definitely wanting to choose those whole food options for those omega-3s. And I, you know, and get them in regularly, especially for growing children. Those whole fats are so, so, so important for their brains and their gut microbes. Um, but we definitely believe in adding in those omega-3s and having those mono and polyunsaturated fats on a really regular basis. Awesome. And then the other nutrient, fiber. So obviously fiber is the, the good logs that you're pouring on the, the fire, or maybe it's the water. You can, you can clarify. Um, I think it's the water. Uh, but, but a lot of fiber, right? Plant foods are extraordinarily fibrous compared to, say, a piece of meat. Obviously, there's zero fiber. So for those who are new to this lifestyle, a lot of times you get complaints because they can't tolerate the, the density of the fiber in the diet all of a sudden. Um, wh what are your recommendations to them? And, you know, um, and I've heard you say, say this before, so I'll, I'll steal your thunder and say, and, and why is it important to look at your, your gut as a muscle that you're training and, and kind of bringing along through this evolution? Great question. Such an important question because I think people come in bright eyed, bushy tailed, and they're like, okay, I'm going from 20 grams of fiber a day to 100. And you are going to feel bloated. You're going to feel like a balloon that's going to fly away because that fiber needs to be fermented, digested, and broken down by the microbes. And yes, they produce these beautiful short chain fatty acids that are like construction workers. They can repair the lining of the intestines, bring down blood sugar, cholesterol so many amazing things, they also make gas. So if you're going from producing a little bit of gas to now five times as much gas, you are going to feel very bloated and full of gas. So low and slow is the name of the game when we're adding fiber. Shoot for maybe an additional five grams of fiber per week until you really work your way up. 
a really good goal for somebody on a plant-based diet that I like to recommend is about 60 grams a day. We know right now per USDA guidelines, they recommend males shoot for about 30 grams a day and females are shooting for about 27 grams of fiber a day. That's pretty in line with the standard American diet, but that's, we, we want to have raise our standards, right? We want to go for what's optimal. So we like to say shooting for at least 60 grams a day, 50 to 60 grams a day, getting there over maybe the course of a couple of months. And then you want to understand, okay, I did it low and slow, but I'm still very bloated, still very gassy. That person might need a little bit of additional support. There might be nuance to their gut. Maybe they need to choose for fibers that are less fermented. So ones that are lower FODMAP. So less fermentable carbohydrates, starches, and fibers. And then maybe they can slowly transition back into more fermentable fibers. And let me just say, fiber is the essential carbohydrate. There are essential amino acids, essential fatty acids. We don't think of carbohydrates being essential. Fiber is that essential carbohydrate where we don't produce it. We have to get it from our environment, meaning our food. And it, and it does wonders. So going back to the city analogy very quickly is, is you know, fiber is that input. It, it is that that economic booster, right? It is that job creator. If, if we're putting fiber into our cities, our little occupants of those cities have purpose. They have work. They are stimulating that city's economy. Whereas if we don't have fiber, it's kind of like a bust, right? There's a great depression going on. No one's going to work and the city is not booming like it should be. So why... Uh... Well, staying on the topic of fiber, and, and it's really interesting that you say it's an essential carbohydrate because I think so much of our popular discourse around diet is is unfortunately impacted by these uh, myths, rumors, dieting lore, right? And carbohydrates are bad, and you know, um, and and there's there's such a lack of nuance, right? Um, which I think is obviously very important when you're talking about health and science, you know, because there are refined carbohydrates like sugar, right? And then there's, I love how you call it, an essential carbohydrate like fiber. And they're both carbohydrates, but they're extraordinarily different. So help us pick apart that a little bit more. What is a, um, uh, I'm totally blinking on the name. Um, I got distracted looking, looking down. Um, uh, prebiotic plant fiber. That's where I was going with it. So pre, a, a prebiotic plant fiber, you know, and as we start to get into probiotics, postbiotics, let's just start there with what is prebiotic fiber? So these prebiotics are basically fibers that are fuel for our microbes. And so we know that these are great fuel sources for them. They're fibers that are not always completely digestible. So some foods that are really high in prebiotic fibers, you might not necessarily completely break down the prebiotic fiber, you're rather fermenting them. So certain foods get completely digested, get completely absorbed, um, you have very little output from them. So, so I love that uh, essential carbohydrate versus Another carbohydrate or refined carbohydrates, a lot of times I think that so much of our popular discourse around nutrition is um, unfortunately impacted by these, these broad kind of assumptions or rumors or, you know, diet lore that all carbohydrates are bad, but they're very different, right? So help us pick apart because a refined carbohydrate like sugar, right, is extraordinarily different than you know, a, an essential carbohydrate, as you say, like fiber, but there's also this word prebiotic fiber. Um, help, help us understand what's the difference with a fiber generally, that, that essential carbohydrate or a prebiotic fiber, maybe they're the same. So most plant foods contain a prebiotic fiber and prebiotic fiber is a type of indigestible fiber. So some fibers are completely broken down. Most carbohydrates are completely broken down, digested, absorbed. Prebiotics are not always completely broken down, um, but they're rather fermented 
by our microbes. And so you might find that you eat them. Hopefully you've chewed them pretty well, but you might find that you pass them and you see them later and you're like, oh yeah. Um, so those indigestible- Corn. Corn, right? corn, I mean, peas, quinoa, right? You might be like, oh yeah, I did eat corn. Um, <laughs> so those are very high in prebiotic fiber. So again, your body might not completely digest and absorb that type of fiber. Rather, it's passing through pretty undigested, passing through your mouth, your, you know, going through your esophagus, your stomach, Stomach, your small bowel where you're doing most of your digestion and absorption there in the small intestine. And then when they reach the last leg of your digestive tract, the colon, they're being fermented by a majority of the microbes that are living there. We know that, you know, 70 plus percent of our microbes are living in our colon. We have over a hundred trillion microbes in our gut microbiome. Most of them are there in the colon. So they have a lot of work to do. So all that, that work that James was talking about when we were talking about fiber, a lot of that is coming from prebiotic fiber. So we're finding that in foods like we just mentioned, corn, quinoa, peas. We find it in things like artichokes, in oats, in plantains, grain or bananas. So we want these fermentable fibers because they really can have very, very unique functions and they can be very unique sources of fuel for important populations of microbes that serve really important functions in our body. So if we're not getting enough prebiotic fiber, then we're not outputting those probiotic, we're not creating more bacteria, healthy bacteria, healthy microbes. We not, might not be creating enough postbiotics. So again, that output from our wonderful microbes might be lowered if we aren't getting giving them enough fuel. And to connect the dots fully here, we have that prebiotic, we're inputting that prebiotic. This is where it is very similar to putting some compost in the garden or if you throw banana peel in your garden and seeing what happens to that banana peel, right? So as that prebiotic fiber hits the colon, this is where we get the probiotic effect, right? We're getting, it is then drawing out from the crypts or from all the structures or think of them as apartment buildings or homes in the city is drawing out the population and go, ooh, banana peel, let's start breaking it up, right? Or in the gut, it's it's the artichoke fiber you ate or like Dahlia mentioned, the green banana or the plantain or whatever it is and they start going to work and that's when you are identifying probiotics. The These are the, the heroes, the pro, they actually have benefits benefits and they're going to work and then producing those postbiotics, right? So in the same way in the garden, these are little microbes eating that banana peel, they're the earthworms, that then you're getting more of the worm castings and you're getting a lot of this benefit in the garden, the same, sorry, benefits in the garden, the same is happening in your gut, right? With these prebiotic fibers. So prebiotic, you're identifying the probiotics who are working on it, and then you're getting the postbiotics, and that's happening inside of you every single day. <laughs> so let, let's, uh, I wanna come back to a couple um, digestion-related items like beans and legumes and TMAO, and, um, but since you've opened it up and, and we're halfway there, um, prebiotics, we're starting to get a sense for Mostly, you know, it, it's the plant matter. Um, let me just clarify, there are, all, all plants have fiber, but not all plants have prebiotic fiber, right? Correct. Yeah. Cool. And so- The spectrum of that can vary, where some have definitely more than others, so there's definitely a spectrum. Okay. Um, but suffice it to say that if you're eating a, a diversity of plant-based whole, plant-based foods, you're going to get that, you know, you're going to touch on all parts of that spectrum and, and kind of be okay as far as the intake of prebiotic fiber or fiber in general, that's where we start. Then there's probiotic and postbiotic that we hear a lot about. Probiotic, you know, I, I, well, maybe I, I won't try to answer it myself. I'll, I'll let you guys um, do that. But but so help us with that journey. You kind of you kind of started to paint the picture, but but what are those postbiotics that you said we're starting to identify once the probiotics go to work on that banana peel in our garden? If, could you just add a little bit more color and 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 maybe connect it to why should we care about these pre, pros, and post? So they're not only so. 
Well, pre we want to care about because you're getting if you're focusing on prebiotics or that fiber, it is it is really a foundational aspect, right? It's going back to that essential carbohydrate where yes, it's going to give benefit to your microbes, but it's kind of yes for all of the above. It's going to give benefit to your whole body. If you are, um, and this goes, I don't know how I want to answer this. This goes into like a deeper, deeper idea of gut health, right? Gut health is caring about if you, if you are sorry, hold on. I might have to edit this. <laughs> um, the idea of gut health is that if you're caring for the smallest organism in your body, you're caring for all of the above, right? So in, in this idea of gut health or overall health, these little microbes that live inside of you that we don't even see and we really didn't even know was there that long ago, uh, if, if we're caring for them, we're caring for all of the above. So if you're caring for the smallest animal in the ecosystem, you're caring for all the animals in the ecosystem. So that's essentially what we're doing when we're eating plants, when we're eating these, these fibers and these prebiotic fibers, we are supporting those tiny little organisms that live inside of us. And then they return the favor, right? So they are, they are then a part of that ecology, that inner ecology, where then it's going to more beneficial microbes, right? So that's what we call the probiotic. So when you have that foundation, when it's a lush, beautiful garden, you're getting more diversity in these beneficial bugs or microbes. That is also happening in the body. Those beneficial bugs, microbes, so to speak, are then going to create more benefit for your plants or for, as we're talking about gut health, for the crypts or the villi or the mucus inside of us. Uh, this is going to happen in short chain fatty acids and like we said, amino acids. So they're going to take care of the structure and provide for that mucosal layer. So basically they start recruiting their friends and they're like, hey, this, this person has our back, come over here. This is a really good ecosystem for us to live in. Then they start creating, you know, they start creating future generations of that. They continue to multiply. So you can think of that as the probiotics. And like James was saying, so not only do those short chain fatty acids, not only are those short chain fatty acids the gifts that they give us, which can do so many things, they can create as much as 30% of our energy in our body. So when someone comes to me and they say, I have such low energy, I'm curious about gut health. Are we missing potentially part or all of that 30% of our energy that our gut could be producing for us each day? Um, so they can definitely communicate and send signals and send these reparative short chain fatty acids to all of our organs, right? If somebody is having low kidney function, we have seen short chain fatty acids can come and support that. We have seen that they can come and support the pancreas to a certain degree. They can support the heart. They can support the liver. They can support the gallbladder. So these short chain fatty acids, the energy that they produce, these pre and pro vitamins that they produce, all of these beneficial outputs mm -hmm. that they produce really are a gift back to us. And them saying, thank you for feeding me the way that I want to be fed. Thank you for helping me clarify my surroundings and surround myself with healthy people, not toxic people, right? We're getting more healthy microbes in the community. And then they're then saying, okay, I love this community. This is full of healthy members. I want to make sure I take really good care of it. I want to make sure that the city is really healthy and there's low crime, low inflammation. <laughs> yeah. There's healthy output from all of us. And, and I want to kind of summarize it with the idea of creating an environment of scarcity versus creating an environment of abundance, right? So in the same way, again, taking a city, for example, if there's not many jobs or not many places to live, there's huge competition. It's, it's hard to have that neighborly cheer when you're constantly competing with your neighbors for food or for resources or for jobs, right? All of the above, the same happens in your gut. So if, if you're creating a lack of mucus, you're creating a lack of structure in the gut, there's less, right? There's scarcity. So maybe more beneficial microbes come in, but the microbes that are there are like, get out of here. This is my spot. And then they can, they can actually with bacteriophages, not to get too complex, but this is where the virome comes in and they're like population control. So when things get too out of hand, the virome comes in and breaks down microbes like bacteria. There's literally viruses that attack and kill bacteria inside of us and they get rid of them. So 
in this scarcity, let's say the standard American diet, right? Hyper refined food, lots of animal products, you're creating that scarcity. Uh, with a plant-based diet, you're creating that abundance where new microbes come in, hey, there's plenty of room, there's plenty to eat, come on in, you can live here, take up residence. And we're even getting deeper where you're taking up residence for generations, right? There's This can even be passed on to your kids and your kids' kids, which is like mind blowing, right? So that's that's awesome. So there's so much to go deeper into, but I have to itch my my curiosity um, on the generational piece. Um, is that environmentally driven, or is that genetically driven? As in, like, I I can guarantee you, my kids have the same. I shouldn't say that. You could imagine. That I can't guarantee anything when it comes to this crazy city. This is way too complicated for me. But I could imagine that because we eat the same foods every day, right? I mean, they don't, you know, they 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 don't have maybe as intense of a smoothie as I do because I just chug it down. And, you know, they they can like they can tell when I put in too much flaxseed. Like they they know they're like, oh, you put in seeds. Like no, <laughs> you know, like because it's grainy, and I'll just chug it down. So like yeah, there's variability. Certainly, they don't drink alcohol, right? Like I try not to, but you know there are weddings. You know, like so so we have some variability. But you could imagine why there's sort of these generational, you know, kind of uh, relationship on a micro uh, biome. Um, uh, level, right? But but are you suggesting maybe there's something deeper? How, how does that relationship work if we know? Kind of like yes to all the above, right? The environment is yes. Also genetics like passed on by your family is a yes. And also the microbiome passed on uh, maternally is a yes. That's a, that's a big one, right? So that's where we get into vaginal delivery, breastfeeding, uh, even kissing, like how close you are uh, kissing and skin to skin and, and contact. This is where we get pretty deep in terms of something coined by Dr. James McKenna of what's called breast sleeping for, for as long as you possibly can where your kids are sleeping in the bed with you and, and you're breastfeeding them. So it, it goes pretty deep. But, um, you know, one thing I like to say is a lot of the times, you know, we grew up, we look at our ancestors, kids grew up here with us, right? They were very close to us. And as we look at it from a microbial standpoint, it's like if the microbes could get enough contact or the, or the more contact we had with our kids, the more microbes we can share with them, it makes a lot of sense. So yes to, to kind of all of that where our genetics are playing in our environment, which includes all of that. What I what I just said, including our microbial genetics, are all playing into that. To what percent and to how much? I think we're we're still trying yeah. to figure that out. But there's, like you said, it can get pretty complex. But all of those things and and whatever you can do, right? It's not like you have to be perfect, but whatever you can do to hit on as many of those things as possible you're just increasing those odds in your favor. Because they can be passed both ways, right? We can pass on inflammatory microbes or anti-inflammatory right. microbes. So our habits certainly will shape our future generation's habits, right? Our kids watch us every day and that just shapes mm. their habits, which then passes down to their microbiome. Um, but so many other things can do that even during conception, during in utero and in those formative years. So we know in really amazing studies, actually the first thousand days of life, including when baby is in utero, um, are the most formative to the foundation of the microbes who are gonna take up residence in their gut. So if, again, those first couple of years and mom's pregnancy were pretty rough, lots of inflammation coming in, that person might struggle a little bit more than somebody mm -hmm. whose mom had great gut health, who again, delivered them vaginally, breastfed, and they had a, a really healthy first couple of years of life. And, and I gotta go back to the city analogy. Imagine the new, the new baby is like a new city. Uh, imagine if you got free reign on Manhattan, right? You pick where you wanna live and it's a mad dash of these microbes going like, ooh, I want the penthouse, I want the big top building, right? And you get to pick and, and better yet, you may even get to build your own home in like a great, beautiful area in a brand new, you know, unpopulated city. That That is what's going on. So if you can add in all these beneficial workers and these microbes into that new city, it is really laying the foundation of that new city and just building it from the ground up. And that inheritance. 
So, so let's just finish on how do we, uh, a few ways to improve and then a few ways to try not to harm our microbiota. And the, the first thing that I have to ask about since we were just talking about pre, pro, and post biotics is, um, should I take a probiotic? Everyone else does. I mean, is that, is that, I mean, cause it's a silver bullet, right? We just add a bunch of these alien bacteria streams into strains into our gut. And they'll take up residence and I won't have to actually think about my diet because the solution is in pill form, right? Yeah. So great question. Um, seldom do we now recommend probiotics. This is, if you asked me this question, maybe six years ago, I would say, yeah, take them. And you know, if you take antibiotics, take probiotics afterward, we've come out with really amazing research in the last couple of years that has shown probiotics should be highly individualized. You really should be using strain specific if you use them at all. But we've even seen things like if you're not fostering those new people and those new migrants in your gut, if you're not fostering those new probiotic inhabitants, even if you keep taking them beyond three weeks, they're gonna show no benefit. It's expensive poop at that point. So one, you wanna make sure are you even taking the correct strain that you need? Different strains will do different things. One strain for one person can make them feel amazing, while for another person, say that person has histamine issues or they're having oxalate intolerance, that could really damage their microbiome or really give them unfavorable symptoms. If it doesn't damage, it's gonna give them unfavorable symptoms. So mm -hmm. I would say, pretty much no for just kind of randomly taking probiotics. You want to know what you're taking. You want to know what's going on in your gut. Um, if you have specific inflammatory conditions going on, or if you have an overabundance of methane gas, certain specific strains sure might be helpful for you. Um, but outside of probiotics, everyday habits that are going to be really amazing and really pay themselves forward in your gut are simple. So getting in fiber, if you need to go low and slow, do that. But getting in sufficient fiber every single day to feed your microbes is so important. Um, we know things like getting in sufficient sleep to allow them to rest, repair, recover, rejuvenate sufficiently every single day is important exercising and moving your body, so important. Uh, dealing with stressors, mental, physical, emotional, uh, chemical stressors, so, so, so important for every single day gut health. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we know also that having a sense of purpose and having a sense of peace, that can decrease stress, that can help your gut microbes as well. Mm -hmm. um, so those, I would say, are my top favorite habits. Um, other, other ones to sprinkle on top, really good oral hygiene. Your oral microbiome is the gate into your gut. So really making sure that you are taking care of your oral microbiome. Um, mm -hmm. So those are things that I want to add. Do you have any others to add before we talk I, about what to avoid? Well, I just got to, I got to go, I got to complete the city analogy, right? So I, that's what, that's what I got to do. But, uh, but no, a great analogy of this is it's really getting into the weeds of your city leaders, right? It's really getting into the weeds of like, who's the mayor of your city? Who, who, who's on the board of supervisors and all that, right? So there's many of us out there who we have a corrupt mayor right or we've been eating these refined foods and not getting enough sleep and the opposite of all those things Delia mentioned as a foundation and we have a corrupt mayor and a corrupt board of supervisors so even if we give all this to our gut maybe it is a, a very expensive probiotic the the board of supervisors is going to use it incorrectly or they're gonna they're gonna you know bury some of these people and like get out of here get out of our city so it, it really goes back to these foundational elements that then say hey we need a new election here we got to switch out some of these supervisors we got to have a new ele election for the mayor get some good microbes in there and now when you eat more of that fiber now when you sleep more and exercise you have more of that energy mm -hmm. it's going to a good place and more importantly it's being utilized more efficiently than it would have been in the old corrupt bad system of the gut so to speak right mm -hmm. so that's kind of that element when yeah. you can't just throw probiotics at, at it right probiotics is like dumping a huge population in a corrupt rundown city 
they're not going to stay there very long. They're just going to, they're going to leave eventually. And again, you have expensive poop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. And if I can add also um, with that and making sure again, that you're properly taking care of all the inhabitants, you want to make sure that you're not nutrient deficient. So on a plant forward yeah. diet, you want to make sure that you're getting in those omega threes important for the gut. Vitamin D is so important for the gut. B vitamins and sufficient numbers and amounts of B vitamins. So, so, so important for the gut. So really trying to ensure that you are encapsulating those things and you are ensuring that you're intaking those things on a very regular basis. Awesome. And thank you for, for bringing closure to the city analogy where we now have an elected set of officials. That's helpful. Um, does the same apply just briefly to uh, kind of probiotic foods. So think about sauerkrauts and kimchi and um, obviously, you know, the, the, the non-vegan blue zone example people always point to is like a fermented dairy drink, right? So, so is, it, is that the same story kind of that, you know, it's, it's bringing in a population that if you don't have the, the underpinning to support them, if you don't have the structural, the leadership, as, as you point out, um, it's just adding, you know, potentially another uh, population to manage and, or is it different because it's food based? can be different. Well, one, we don't always know the survivability of some of these probiotic foods. So we don't know how well they'll survive stomach acid or how they've been stored. Most probiotics are denatured above 112, 118 degrees. And so how are they stored? How are they kept uh, over time? How have they denatured? Will they survive your stomach acid? The ones that do survive can be advantageous because a lot of times they come with prebiotic and the probiotic together. So take sauerkraut, take kimchi, even a lot of these dairy-free yogurts, they have prebiotics added to them. So you are gonna have a little bit more of a synergistic effect. You're probably going to be more likely to create those postbiotics, those outputs, when you're getting in both together. And even if you don't get the benefit of the probiotics, say they are denatured, you're still getting in the prebiotics. So they can still certainly be beneficial and still play into that whole gut story, that whole city and support the population. Yeah, and, and many studies are showing with fermented foods, you are getting those anti-cancer effects. You are getting this, the, the building up, like Dolly mentioned, of that structure. You are getting a lot of these effects that start when it goes in your oral microbiome. Mm -hmm. So there is fermented, there's a benefit of fermented foods in your oral microbiome. So maybe, it, maybe some or not as much as we think gets to our colon, but along that route, there's, there are many benefits, especially in the esophagus. So a lot more studies coming out on that. And, and yeah, when it comes to fermented foods, you are getting that synergistic effect. You are getting that whole food element, which is really cool. Uh, one of my last questions, um, coffee in particular, or say coffee and tea, if, if that distinction doesn't matter, and, uh, and then alcohol. Um, so some of the favorite substances in the modern world. O obviously, we've all heard alcohol just wrecks the bacterial populations, uh, the microbiota. Um, is that true? Is it like you're starting over from scratch? I mean, because, you know, wine is fermented, right? So is there any benefit? Maybe I'm getting a benefit. So t tell us how, how much damage are we doing from a gut health perspective when we drink? Alcohol is probably a separate subject, but, but coffee or, or tea, other caffeine drinks that we all enjoy. Yeah, so I think this is where again context matters, right? And and I mean, yeah, to first touch more on coffee and tea, this is where the, there's a vast spectrum when it comes to coffee and tea, right? And ideally, I would say in an ideal world, we're all drinking whole leaf tea. So some of our favorites are matcha and sencha, for example. And, and let's say even more in an ideal world, like this is we have like a good, better, best system, right? Let's say this, let's start with best, why not? It's organic, holy sencha or mancha, meaning that they are, they're not spraying with tons of synthetic pesticides. It, it's grown in a healthy, regenerative way. So we're helping the soil, which in turn help, helps the plant and helps us. And then we're using that whole leaf. So we're actually getting some of that fiber. And again, we're talking about whole food synergy here on top of all the benefits of that leaf, right? So that is where people people kind of question like green tea versus matcha what's the big deal the big deal is that powder is is basically giving you that whole plant that whole leaf 
and that is exponentially increasing the benefits and the nutrients you're getting from that that tea, right? Um, and then the spectrum continues down from there. I mean, yeah, green tea is great. Hibiscus, which can even give you some iron and all these different phytonutrients and deep colors. And we keep going. Um, coffee does does have benefits as well. I mean, you're doing coffee. Of course, coffee is one of the biggest, one of the biggest monocultures in the world. We do heavily spray coffee. So that's where being aware of, is my coffee being sprayed before, during, and after production? Am I getting then exposed to more of those pesticide residues, which are going to neg negatively affect the gut and so on? So another, another pretty deep question, but you wanted to add? Yeah. To that. So you Absolutely. If you are getting more benefits than risk out of drinking those things, if you're getting more antioxidants and it's not giving you reflux, if you're not having diarrhea, if they're not necessarily offsetting the balance, you have pretty good gut health absolutely go for some of those things. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're recognizing, I don't handle caffeine well. Maybe you're going for um, just herbal teas, or maybe you're going for decaf coffee, which has a fraction of the caffeine in it. With alcohol, I think, you know, we can pretty definitively say that it's not a health food, whether it's completely deleterious and one drink is going to wipe out your gut microbes. No, I don't think that's the case either. But again, it's, it's certainly a treat. So do we think that a nightly glass of wine is going to support gut health? There's no evidence to show that, but there is evidence to show we use alcohol topically to clean things. And so while it might not wipe out an entire population in our gut, alcohol, yes, comes with antioxidants. It can contain resveratrol, but you want to really consider that risk benefit ratio. If you're already working really hard and struggling on repopulating your gut, maybe alcohol every day or even every week isn't in your best interest. Matt, you mentioned you go to weddings or, you know, sometimes for occasionally you might have some alcohol. That's not going to undo all of your daily healthy habits. Um, but for anyone, really, I wouldn't say, yes, have alcohol nightly. They've even come out with new research showing even one drink of alcohol can detract from brain health. So if it is that impactful on our brain, I can only imagine the studies that are yet to be done on gut health and alcohol. So once in a while, fine, all the time, probably not. Um, tea for us would probably be a top choice. Coffee sometimes, um, if you handle the caffeine and if it's not sprayed alcohol, you want to really sprinkle that in yeah. sparingly or avoid it if you just feel like you can do without. This is a perfect place to end on where James says like, yeah, it's like giving a bunch of alcohol to the population of the city. More bad things are going to happen if everyone's drunk, right? Um, there are so many of those topics that I want to get into, you know, like kombucha, we didn't touch on TMAO. Um, there's so many of these like uh, chickpea pastas. I I'd love to kind of plumb the depths with you and get into those more specific, a little bit nerdy questions because you guys have such a wealth of information. But we, we are at the hour mark and I want to make sure this is digestible, pun intended, for those who are watching. Um, so let me just really say um, thank you so much for, for sharing a little bit of your wisdom and your time with us this afternoon. I know I learned a bunch, but I'm excited for a round two with you really soon. We can't wait. We, we look forward to round two and this was great. We have so much fun talking about all things gut. <laughs>